All right, good to see you. I hear a little cheer in the congregation, and so uh, I, that's always a wonderful sound to me, to hear children's voices. And uh, the more we go in life, uh, the, precious, the more precious that sound is. I want you to open your Bibles to that passage in Romans chapter 4, and I want to ask you a question this morning. How do you live in the blessing of God? Have you ever wondered that? How does a church stay under the blessing of God? Now, it's very easy for us in North America. We have so much. Money may not be a blessing from God. It's because we got a lot of money. That, that, that may not be a God's blessing. That's an indication of God's favor. Even the health may not. Uh, we have doctors who know how to treat us and know how to help us when there are bad things happening in our bodies. If we exercise and take care of ourselves, uh, unless we're one of those rare someones that has something genetic, chances are we're going to be in a good shape. Uh, there's prosperity in this nation. There's prosperity that's often thought of, we're America. We were founded on Christian principles. So was Israel, on godly principles. But if you go to other parts of the nation, in the poorest of the poor in our own nation, or if you drive through those parts of town that you're not used to driving through, and pay attention. Or if you go to Africa and move out of Port Harcourt into the northern parts where Islam is in control in Nigeria, you'll discover poverty like you've never seen. No wealth whatsoever and in parts of Central America and Africa and other parts of the world, you'll see little babies with pink eyes and distended bellies because they have an amoeba that you could go to any doctor in the room and they could give you some medication. And if that was your child or your grandchild, take care of that in just a few days. Material blessings are an indication of the blessing of God because everything comes from the hand of God. But it does not by itself indicate that God is blessing. God is blessing when his people are living in demonstration of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. God is blessing when there is an absence of the tyranny of evil. And the evil one is always trying to engage and always trying to make inroads. I didn't have a lot of people listen to me But when I was working in the areas of our state where there were shootings when I was with the state convention, I wrote a little booklet that got pretty much shelved as fast as it could on what churches need to do and what other people need to do in order to protect themselves from the harm of mass shooters. And the first stage was prayer. And in our world, there's a frustration with prayer because of the tremendous amount of Facebook terminology, thoughts and prayers, thoughts and prayers, thoughts and prayers. And finally, people that are hurting just go, Pfft. but that's not what I was talking about. It's not just thoughts and prayers. 
It is praying as God instructs us to pray. It is asking as God has instructed us to ask. Cheryl and I suffered through more British protocol than I ever want to see again by just watching the service from Westminster Abbey yesterday with King Charles, the coronation. I thought it amazing how often in that Christian service, in that church, and I've been in Westminster Abbey, it is ornate. All of that designed to reflect the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And yet when you come right down to it, they were praying in their songs and in their prayers for favor. For favor. For Psalm 90, verse 17. For favor. Let's look at our text. I I believe Paul is telling us how to live in the blessing of God. And I don't think there's any other way because I believe this is God's revelation and what God has brought to us from the very beginning. And if you'll notice in Romans, uh, in the first chapter, he introduces that the book is really about the gospel of God. This is the good news of God. And in chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, he talks about that. But in verse 18 through chapter 3, verse 20, uh, the writer is talking to us uh, about the sinfulness of all humanity. And in other words, none of us have been able to achieve by works enough to please God or to deal with past sins. If you and I could live perfect from this moment forward, we can't go back and change yesterday. We're sinners. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We saw that last week. Now, as you go even further in the passage we're in today, it's part of that section through chapter 8 where Paul is talking about the gospel, what God has done for us in Christ. And here in this passage today, he's talking about Abraham. So I want to just go sort of verse by verse and comment as we go along because I, I, I just really couldn't see a good outline for this that made sense. And I think verse by verse it does. But listen to verse 1. What then can we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh has found? In other words, Paul is looking at the Jewish people in Rome and in that church at Rome, and he's saying, let's go back and look at Abraham. What did Abraham find? What was his discovery? He is the father of Judaism. He's the father of our faith. He's our forefather, our ancestor. Let's take a look at him. And verse 2, if Abraham was justified by works, then he has something to brag about. In other words, if, if our forefather Abraham earned God's favor by something that he did, then he has a right to brag. Remember last week, we saw that there was no room for boasting. And here in this passage, he reminds us of that. And he says, then he has something to brag about, but not before God. You see, we run into the problem sometimes of comparing ourselves with one another. Well, I'm certainly not the best out there, but I'm better than this one. That's sort of the way we compare ourselves from time to time with one another. And and Paul is saying the comparison is with God. God is the sovereign of the universe. God is the one before whom we stand. And then he asks the right question in verse 3. He says, well, what does the Scripture say? Now, we looked at Scripture last week and the inspiration of Scripture, and we went over several different Scriptures that tell us that the Bible is the Word of the living God. God's Word is truth. Psalm 119, verse 160 says, The entirety of your Word is truth. And so we know Scripture is truth, and and Paul is appealing to even the Old Testament Scriptures. And he says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him for righteousness. And as he goes on in this passage to talk to us, we discover that the symbols of our faith, whether it was circumcision in the Old Testament, 
baptism in the new, which that's not in this passage, but it's applicable, or the Lord's Supper, these symbols of our faith do not save us. They do not come prior to our salvation. In other words, no human being was ever saved because they were circumcised. No human being was ever saved because they were baptized. You can baptize them as infants. You can baptize them as teens. You can baptize them as adults. You can dip. You can pour. You can sprinkle. Baptism does not save, nor does the Lord's Supper. Taking these elements that we'll take later on does nothing in terms of salvation. It is a remembrance And that's why we ask people who do not know Jesus Christ not to partake of the Lord's Supper because you're drinking and eating judgment to yourself. You have nothing to remember if you've never trusted Christ. But if you've trusted Christ, you're welcome at the table. But he comes after, not before. Paul talks of the circumcision. He makes a strong case. If you go down to verses 9 and through 12, he talks about Abraham believed God. It was counted to him as righteousness. And then he talks about circumcision and that circumcision did not save. And look at it in Genesis chapter 15. When you go to Genesis chapter 15, God is calling Abraham. Verse 1, do not be afraid, Abram, I am your shield, your reward will be very great. But Abram said, O God, what can you give me since I'm childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Abram continued, look, you have given me no offspring, so a slave born in my house will be my heir. Now the word of the Lord came to him, this one will not be, in your, not be your heir, instead one who comes from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look at the sky and count the stars, if you're able to count them. Then he said, your offspring will be that numerous. And listen to verse 6 in Genesis chapter 15. Abram believed the Lord, and he, the Lord, credited to him, Abram, as righteousness. Now, Abram goes and tells his wife, and Sarah gets involved, and Uh, They believe God and they trust what God says he's going to do, but they decide to help God out a little bit. And in their fleshly way of helping God out because they could only see the fleshly aspect of childbirth, in their fleshly way of helping God out, they produced Ishmael. He was not the son of promise. Isaac was, that came later. But in verse 17, God gave to Abram the covenant of circumcision. And he said in verse 10, This is my covenant which you are to keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every one of your males must be circumcised. You must circumcise the flesh of your foreskin to serve as a sign of the covenant between me and you. Throughout your generations, every male among you at eight days old is to be circumcised. Jesus was circumcised at eight days of age. The Hebrews practiced that. But circumcision did not save. Circumcision was a sign of a covenant that God had given them. And Abraham and everyone from Abraham to this day have been saved by believing God and trusting God. It's salvation by faith, not works. Ishmael was circumcised. But he certainly was not a part of the Jewish nation. Circumcision was a sign of the covenant. God's covenant was in his word that he had given to Abram, and Abram believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. So you say, Pastor, where are you going with this? Good question. Good question. Saving faith is believing faith. It's simply believing what God says. 
For example, you read something in Scripture, you read a command to obey. When you step out and obey it, that's faith. You're believing God. You're believing what God says. And the Scripture says, let God be true and every other human being a liar. We're to believe the truth of God's Word. That's why we teach and preach that the Bible is the living Word of God, inspired, infallible, inerrant, and we are to read and heed. That's faith. The Holy Spirit indwells each and every one of us since Pentecost when we come to faith in Christ. Not only do we have the written Word, but the Holy Spirit will lead us I know there are people that go to seed on both ends of this. There are folks that go to seed on one end of it and every little impression they have, well, God told me. You're almost always wrong when you get into that. The other extreme that you're almost always wrong is, well, if you better write that down as Scripture. No, that doesn't mean someone's writing Scripture because God speaks to them. Not every Scripture writer was an apostle. Luke wasn't. He was a physician. But he wrote Luke, he wrote Acts, and some scholars believe he wrote Hebrews. And he wrote about the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. He wrote about, if he wrote Hebrews, he wrote about the covenant, the blood covenant. And so Paul is teaching us that there is no right of the faith, circumcision, or in the New Testament era, anything else that will save us, but it's trusting what God said he would do. It's believing God. Now, unfortunately, the extremes of that talk about, well, if you're going to believe that uh, God is speaking to you, uh, then you need to write that down. Well, I suggest you write it down, but not as Scripture. And let me show you the error of that total extreme thinking like that. We need to be cautious when we say God is speaking to me. We need to test it according to His Word. But God does speak to His people through the power of the Holy Spirit. Jimmy Draper preached that when he was here. I'm helping edit his new book on the Holy Spirit. When it comes out, I'll make sure we have copies if anyone wants one because it's just simple truths. But brothers and sisters, the Spirit of God speaks to you. How, how did you know to call me as your pastor? Well, we had a search committee that put your name out there. Yeah, but you prayed, I hope. And at least then, 97.3% of you said it's God's will. You come as our pastor. How did you know that? How did I know when I was given the opportunity to come here as pastor? There's not a word in this Bible that says, Ted, go to Harlingen. There's not a word in this Bible that says, Calvary, call Ted. You know that. Because of the Holy Spirit living within you and the voice of God speaking to you. And the scripture confirms it. And God confirms his voice every step of the way. And so to believe God is to obey God. That's faith, that's trust. Now, I don't know how things are down here. I haven't seen it as much, but in the Metroplex, we've got everything in the world. I mean, everything is up there. And I have a friend who would shake his head, and he said, my mom would talk about something, and then she would come by, and she'd say, well, I'm going to believe God for it. He said, what on earth does that mean? I'll tell you what it meant in her because I knew her. It meant in her life that if there was something out there she wanted to see happen, she would just begin praying about it. She would name it. She would claim it. And she would, quote, believe God for it. Is that faith? No. Nope. 
Now, God may have answered some of those prayers, but it's not faith. It's not what Paul's talking about. What they were doing is similar to the prosperity gospel. If I just see something out here that I want, uh, I'm going to give. And and if if I want a tenfold blessing, I'm going to go to the church or somebody's ministry or whatever, and I'm going to drop $1,000 in the offering plate. And I'm going to trust God to give me a tenfold blessing that there be a 10,000 return, or now they're into the hundredfold blessing. Now, I want to tell you, if there's any of you here that have $1,000 to drop in the plate, we appreciate it. The church thanks you. It will be used in our budget, which you have laid out. But I can't promise you that God's going to give you back $10,000 or $100,000. I can promise you that if you're obedient to God, He said He would bless you. He gets to define what that is. Now, what the blessing is here before my time is gone is salvation. Paul gives Abraham as an example with circumcision, and then he comes back and talks about David, and he quotes from Psalm 32, verse 1, in verses 7 and 8, when he says, How happy those whose lawless acts are forgiven and whose sins are covered. How happy the man whom the Lord will never charge with sin. In the actual psalm itself, how happy is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How happy is the man the Lord does not charge with sin. The Christian Standard Bible says we'll never charge with sin. The NIV said, does not count against his sins against him, and in whose spirit is no deceit. Paul redacts that just a little bit to say to us that what God is saying is that through faith, through faith, through believing what God has said and acting upon what God has said, your sins can be forgiven, and the Lord will never charge you with sin. Now, if you really understood that, you'd jump up and down and shout. Because some of you in this room are living a life of guilt over past sins. And if you come to faith in Jesus Christ, you don't have to. You are free from that guilt. You do not have to live that lifestyle beaten down by the devil. Isaiah chapter 53 The scripture says of Jesus, yet the Lord was pleased to crush him and he made him sick. When you made him a restitution offering, he will see his seed, he will prolong his days and the will of the Lord will succeed by his hand. He will see it out of his anguish and he will be satisfied with his knowledge. My righteous servant will justify many and he will carry their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him the many as a portion and he will receive the mighty as a spoil because he submitted himself to death and was counted among the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressor. When you and I came to faith in Jesus Christ and we believed what God said about sending him to the cross to shed his blood for our sins, in that moment when we trusted him, our sins were gone forever. I spoke of it last week, but it's in the text again this week, so I have to address it. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, the scripture says, If we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves. The truth is not in us. John is talking about people who claim to live a sinless life, who've never sinned. He talks about that in that passage. Then he says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When you stand before God as a believer in heaven, you are not going to stand before God to give an account of sins under the blood of Jesus. 
You're not convinced, are you? When you stand before God as a believer, you are not going to give account of sins that are under the blood of Jesus. You're not. And I want to tell you something. The reason we have so much discord in our lives today and the reason evil is rampant in our society and the jealousy and everything like that is because a bunch of people are still trying to work their way to heaven. If I can just be good enough, I'm better than you. I don't like you. I do this and I do that. I want to tell you why we do that. We do that because we're still living the story of our lives from hurt and pain and sin rather than living in the story of Jesus. God's word says, how happy the man whom the Lord will never charge with sin. Isn't that great? You can live free. You can live a joyous life. Sure, junk goes on down here. It does in everybody's life. It does in every culture. But you can live free. You can live free. I uh, was interested yesterday. I watched the expressions, and I have no insight into what's going on in anybody's heart. But I watched some people, they were caught up in the festivities of the occasion. And there were smiles on their faces at the coronation. I watched others on screen whose faces were very solemn. And wherever they were in their faith, there was an expression of that solemnity. And I just wondered myself, in a post-Christian era in which Britain lives and the United States lives, how were those great texts that they were reading and singing play out in the actual lives of the people who were listening and participating? I watched as they were singing. And I told Cheryl, I said, you can tell which ones go to church. What's true there is true here. It's true with every one of us. My favorite school teacher growing up was Edith Smith. She was a godly Presbyterian woman. She came to hear me preach one night and I preached out of Hebrews 9 on the blood of Jesus. I was in a revival meeting back uh, in my home area. She walked up afterwards and she grabbed my hand and smiled and she was a little hunchback by that time. And she said, oh, she said, what a wonderful message. She said, thank you, thank you, thank you for telling these people they can't work their way to heaven. She said, so many of these Baptists think they worked their way to heaven. Thought about that a lot since then. You know, I grew up in a Baptist church. I, I don't know. Larry Russell was a Texas Baptist music evangelist and he used to sing a song, Baptist to the Bone. Google it. It's hilarious. Actually, Todd makes fun of our hypocrisies. When I was in seminary, we would change the wording of a song. My hope is built on nothing less we would sing than Jesus' blood and righteousness. We'd sing my hope is built on nothing less but Schofield Notes and Broadman Press. We all have the tendency to come to Christ for that act 
of deliverance and salvation. And then we transfer ourselves to works and we compare ourselves with one another for the rest of our lives and we miss the joy of total forgiveness. Don't miss it. How happy the person, I'm going to say, because man is used generic there, whom the Lord will never charge with sin. Are you one of those? Oh, Brother Ted, yes. I, I remember when I trusted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Second question, are you living in that trust? Do you believe God? It's right there in his word. Go home this afternoon. Take your Bible and go from cover to cover this next two or three weeks and try to prove me wrong because it's what the book teaches. It's not our works. It's not our symbols. It's the grace of God through faith. Would you bow your head with me, please? While our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, and I just want to ask you in this room, we're going to prepare to receive the Lord's Supper, and this is a part of our worship service. So the invitation is going to be very specific. I'm going to ask you right where you are, if you've never trusted Jesus, what a day it will be, the day you trust him as your Lord and Savior. And he said that if we would believe, he would give us the right to become children of God. So right here, in this moment, if in your heart you'll reach out to him, I want you to just pray a simple prayer like this. Lord God, I know I'm a sinner. And I want to give my life to you. Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sins, and I believe you were buried. And God raised you from the dead on the third day. Take control of my life. I believe your word, and I trust you now as my Lord and Savior. While our heads are still bowed in the privacy of the moment, if you prayed that prayer with me, would you lift your hand, please, just across the room? I don't thank you. Thank you. Several of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to identify yourself. We're going to sing a verse of a hymn. I'm going to be standing here at the front. And I want you to get up and come and let one of us pray with you. But if for some reason or other you say, I... I I'm a guest, but I, I want to know more. I'm, I, I, I want to know more, Pastor. Would you help me? Then I want you to fill out one of those information cards and take it to the table at the back when we dismiss today. There'll be a lady standing back there. She has a free gift for all first-time guests, and that's a gift from our church, and she'll receive that card and get it to me and I'll make contact with you. If you're in this room and you'd like to join this church today, we welcome you. We welcome you. So you get up out of your seat and identify yourself. We don't twist arms. We don't coerce anyone. But we want you. And so after I pray, we're going to stand. We're going to sing one verse. And you step out as you stand, you stand stepping to the aisle and come in Jesus' name. Father, I pray that you would put it in the hearts of each one to obey you. And may we find ourselves obedient to you today, for that is faith, obeying you, stepping out in obedience. Whatever it is you've called us to do, we obey you, and that is faith. And we ask in Jesus' name.